Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled The New South. One of the things we see during the Gilded Age and Progressive Era is how U.S. society, its economic structure, its political institutions, and its culture changed from three distinct regions into a solidified nation. In the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, this move toward a single nation was not assured, and it continued to be forced throughout the 19th century. I'm not speaking of just the relationship between the Union and the former Confederacy, but of the relations between the sections of the Northeast Midwest, the South, and the West. Let's talk now about the New South. To begin with, let's orient with a map, because we're talking about a newly impoverished section of the country, the former Confederate States, as you see here. Not to put too fine a point on it, but in defeat, the former Confederate states had to realign both their relations with the two other sections, but also had to recover economically from the loss of cotton markets that had made the South one of the wealthiest societies, at least for the owners of capital and money, lands, and slaves, in the entire world. The loss of cotton from the southern U.S. led British cotton manufacturers to open cotton lands in Egypt and India, so when the Civil War was over, the South no longer had a monopoly over cotton prices. Additionally, the loss of land and slaves depressed the Southern economy. That is, slaves were a source of wealth and capital, $4 billion worth, that were no longer available to fuel the Southern economy. Young men who came to the fore after the Civil War, and Union men sympathetic and hopeful that the South could achieve economic integration and a free labor industrial economy, pushed the so-called New South Creed, eh, somewhat cynically and self-servingly. One was Pennsylvania Congressman William Pig Iron Kelly, who spoke throughout the South during Reconstruction, sometimes inciting riots, kind of by accident, urging Southerners to adopt industry and sectional reconciliation. And you see him on the right. Another was Atlanta Henry Grady, on the left, who died in 1889 at the age of 39, who is considered the foremost Southern exponent of the New South Creed. Grady was the owner-editor of the Atlanta Constitution newspaper and an influential Democratic politician. There were, of course, others. Many were editors of what we now call trade journals. These were particularly manufacturers' newspapers in the Carolinas and along both the sea coast and the coast of waterways. But Grady was the most well-recognized source of New South propaganda. As trumpeted by Grady, the New South Creed emphasized sectional reconciliation and industry. The Creed recognized that the Old South was based on slavery, cotton, and plantations, but that the New South had to be based on industry, free wage labor, yeoman farmers, and democracy. All of this New South hypothesizing, however, required maintaining white supremacy. Now, white supremacy was fine with most of the politically, economically, and socially powerful people of the North and West, as well as the South, who all looked on former slaves and African Americans in general as little more than hands fit only for the most menial labor and to keep wages low. Now, this New South propaganda was one thing, but the reality of an industrialized post-bellum South was something a little bit different. The Southern economy was organized around manufacturing, extractive industries, but still overly dependent on agriculture, particularly cotton farming. Textile manufacturing, that is weaving cloth, grew from antebellum roots into a haven for white families fleeing the harsh conditions of agriculture. From 1868 to 1900, the number of cotton mills in the South grew from 161 to 400. The number of operatives increased by 500%, and the amount of cotton consumed increased by over 800%. This means that the South saw more mills that had larger staffs who were more productive. Unfortunately, this did not spawn a tool-making industry. Southern mills imported looms and other tools from New England, and it was the tool-making industry 
that had not only real profits, but also long-term sustainability. Another industry was pig iron manufacturing and steel making, as well as the making of iron products like stoves and cast iron pipe. Birmingham, also called the Pittsburgh of the South, was founded in 1871 and Chattanooga was an important cast iron pipe and stone manufacturing center. The railroads were the largest users of iron, as were the railway car makers. These car makers formed the basis of the economies of Anniston, Alabama and Rome, Georgia, for example. Now here's a slide of pig iron making. They called these ingots pig iron because as the iron flowed after being melted from ore, from the furnace that you see on the left, diagonally to the right, it flowed into a channel cut into the sand floor. Then it flowed into secondary channels that you see coming off of that main channel. And then it flowed into ingots, all cut into the sand floor. These ingots connected to these secondary channels reminded these farm boys who were working as steel makers they're called puddlers for the most part. It reminded them of piglets feeding uh, uh, off of a sow. In addition, extractive industries became important in the South. Iron mining, limestone quarrying, and coal extraction fed the blast furnaces of Birmingham. Lumber denuded vast stretches of the piney woods of the coastal plain and the naval stores industry, the turpentiners and tar makers and gum and resin makers, literally juiced the forests that were cut down by the lumber manufacturers. But the largest segment of the southern economy was still agriculture. And of that segment, cotton regained its throne as king. Cotton production rose significantly between the Civil War and 1900, with acreage increasing to 300% and yield increasing by 500%. But prices fell. In fact, they plunged by over 50% because of the continuing glut on the market. Cotton had become a global industry and global problems affected it. Other commodities grown in the New South of the Gilded Age included rice along the Carolina and Georgia coasts and tobacco that fed the growing cigarette making market created by the invention of the ready-made cigarette machine and its use extensively by the Duke family of North Carolina. Agriculture was organized differently in the New South than the old. Plantations slowly crept back into being with reconstruction but failed experiments with hiring farm workers uh, made the plantation elite change how they dealt with labor. Historian Gavin Wright thought of antebellum plantation owners as labor lords who worked the land until it gave out, then moved their enslaved workforce ever further west. Post-bellum plantation owners, he says, became landlords without the work of slave labor then these plantation owners no longer continued to move. They were stuck in place and had to deal with the land that they owned at that point. The way they got the labor they needed ultimately was through sharecropping. Cash poor landlords and early on cash poor black farmers who saw that freedom meant control over a parcel of land but were too poor to pay for it agreed to work on what's called shares. Shares was a rental agreement that allowed the farmer to raise and sell a crop and pay the landlord a percentage of the receipts for rent, often one-third to one-half. As the system grew from generation to generation, laws changed to favor the landlords and the furnishing merchants who kept the books and told sharecroppers how much they owed. White farmers also without resources to pay cash rent, became sharecroppers too. The most problematic part of this system was the ever-tightening crop lien laws passed by legislatures dominated by these landlords. In addition to paying rent on the land, sharecroppers paid for their seed, food, tools, and mules 
through shares to furnishing merchants, often at a price contracted before the crop sold. When the crop sold for less than what it took to pay off that contracted price, the croppers fell into legalized debt peonage and had to stay on the land, legally were forced to stay on the land until they paid their debts. It was a system ripe for abuse, and over time, it was abused surely. This is a picture of the black belt. Many people think that the black belt is called that, and of course, as you see here, it's the darker area of this map, because black people live there. Now, it's true that African Americans live in large numbers in the black belt, but that's because the land was fertile, and it was the right kind of land, prairie loam over a chalk base, that was perfect for cotton growing. And so as antebellum cotton plantations, as antebellum labor lords moved from place to place with their pool of enslaved labors, labor, they set up shop in the black belt. And upon emancipation, many African Americans stayed more or less put in the area in which they achieved their freedom. Let's look at how governance took place in the New South. The New South was not all that different from the Old South, except there was more industry and no legal chattel slavery. But the same class of large landowners, joined now by industrialists, held power. In the 1870s, across the entire South, so-called Redeemer governments reestablished all white legislatures and arch-conservative rule throughout the South. Together, the big planters and the big mules had an alliance that reimposed low expenditures on public needs from the state, tax policies that favored plantations and large industries, restrictions on labor, particularly restrictions on unionization, or the quick resort to state resources to crush unions, and white supremacy. Coupled with this, and part of it, was the establishment of Jim Crow laws. These were laws that increased harsh legal segregation that became more vehement as blacks, who were no longer legally subservient to whites, had to be kept, as it was said, in their place of subjugation to whites. Legally enforced segregation barely existed until after the Civil War. Slavery prevented any anxiety about equality under the law or in society between the races. But without slavery, Jim Crow became the new legal order. One of the most significant turning points in legalizing racially discriminatory state statutes was the Supreme Court case called Plessy v. Ferguson of 1896 that allowed separate but equal facilities to keep the races apart. Yet that wasn't enough, and the older majoritarian pressure of mob rule reared its head over and over, and there was a dramatic increase in lynchings, that is, extra-legal executions of, in the South, African Americans. This concept of show lynching also became a trend after 1893. Another significant episode in Jim Crow laws were the statutes and constitutions across the South in the 1890s and 1900s that systematically disfranchised African Americans and poor whites. We're aware of the various mechanisms used to discriminate against black voters and poor white voters. Poll taxes were payments to vote that accumulated from year to year. In a cash-strapped economy, only those with access to cash could pay up. Literacy tests were another mechanism of preventing voting. When illiteracy ranged as high as 25% in 1910 for white males, literacy tests were especially useful in preventing blacks in particular from voting. One way that poor white voters bypassed these impediments, at least for a generation, were the so-called grandfather clauses that stated if a voter's grandfather had fought in the Civil War, that person could vote re without regard to literacy tests and occasionally without regard to poll taxes. 
So the South was its own region, even into the 20th century. But the lure of industrialization and the shared white supremacy of the Confederacy and its former foes did not inhibit a reconciliation. Now, we were talking about literacy, uh, lynching, and you can see from this map where lynchings occurred between 1882 and 1927, and you can see in particular the large number of lynchings across the old Confederacy. This isn't to say that other places did not have significant numbers of lynchings. So look in Wyoming, for example. But as a region, it, it appears there were uh, many more in the Deep South than in any other particular region. Well, once again, we're at the end of the lecture. And as always, thank you for your time and attention.